Let's talk about love again. Once again, we're gonna talk about love. Let's take a deep breath. Let's grab some tea. I'm using my Uncle Iroh teapot today for today's podcast. Did I say my name is Brittany Simon? My name is Brittany Simon. Welcome to my podcast. I also have the Dandy Liver Detox Tea from Lifestyle Awareness. My sister-in-law bought this for me, so I'm kind of trying it out. It's actually pretty good. Okay, in today's video, we're gonna talk about love. After a conversation I had with a homie of mine, he said a particular, a couple things that I actually like stood out to me as quite profound when it comes to relationships. So I thought I would share it with you guys and then we could talk about it. I understand that some of the things I'm gonna say are gonna make your brains go, oh, red flag, this sounds like a toxic relationship. Take a deep breath. Everything that is good to someone else is toxic to another person, okay? So two things that he said that really stood out to me, I've got my notes here. Um, the first one is you, when you're in a relationship, you're in love and this is a romantic, you're in love. You, you love the consciousness that is the person that you're interacting with, right? You could say, um, that being in love is trusting someone to help you being vulnerable enough to allow yourself to be helped by others. You could also say that when you're in love, um, you're giving permission to someone else to make you a better person. Okay. So those are the two notes for the, the top of this moment here. And then, um, I have this other note here that I really wanna to discuss too. When you're in relationships, sometimes the way we go about discussing being in those relationships is almost through a, a lens of insecurity that's sort of frustrating to hear. An example would be, hey, are you single right now? Uh, yes, I am. No, I'm not, right? Hey, uh, what do you think about dating guys with tattoos? Uh, I don't know, I guess I'm open to it. All of these questions from a man to a woman might be him inquiring whether or not she's even accessible enough to ask out. I've heard that men are less likely to ask you out if they think they're gonna be rejected. So what they do is try to find a yes before making the declaration of, I want you, do you want me? What's interesting about that I think is the supposed manosphere bubble that always pushes the narrative that men are strong and they know what they want and they're capable and women aren't. And at the same time, they're trying to help the men that aren't capable, which they claim is sort of the also majority of men because a majority of men are not high value men, right? And so that's kind of weird to say, so there is sort of a conversation to be having around the politics of gender and whether or not we really need to be like men versus women or whether we just want to embrace the fact that men and women are different. I am obsessed with love and relationships. I was just listening to uh, Adam22 talk about how, um, with his wife, talk or fiance, talk about how um, you know, men, when they run podcasts, talk about their hobbies and interests and things outside of themselves. When women talk about relationships or when women have podcasts, they talk about relationships or men or love. And I think women like people and men like things. So that makes a lot of sense. And I don't really think is, uh, necessary to make it a, who has a better way of examining the world. Cause to be honest, like though men have built amazing things in the world, they're also the reason for a lot of destruction. Even though women have been very wonderful when it comes to interpersonal relationships, they've also been the arbiters of a lot of drama and toxicity. So I think the way that I wanna see it is, let's say it's not about the politics of even dating. You know, I'm feminist and I feel like I should date this kind of man. I'm a man and I feel like I should date this kind of woman. And we're using heterosexual language because it's just easier, but I might throw in some gay examples. You know what I'm saying? When you're dating, you're really just dating, depending on your view of dating, maybe to find love, maybe to have short-term companionship. Let's remove all the short-term companionships and just talk about people who wanna live and fall in love with like very special people and they want those people to feel like they're everything. When we form relationships that are about you being my everything, it forces you to put into perspective a couple of things. Your value as an individual who wants and is asking someone to make you their everything, right? That's kind of a big ask. Hi, I, I know you've been living this whole life you know, separate from me. I know you have all these hobbies and loved ones, but now that you're with me, I'd like you to think about life in a completely different way. That can work for some people and those relationships are great. For some people, it's just about marrying someone who's already on the flow that you're on. So it's quite easy as well in that regard. Either way, it's still a big ask to look at another human, another consciousness and say, I really hope that you wanna bond and create a life with me. Well, what are you really asking of that person? In so many ways, as I'm examining my trope, I am made aware that I am asking someone to let me feel safe enough to ask them for help, or I am asking someone in many ways to help make me a better person, and I hope that I can do that for them. I am asking for vulnerabilities. It's funny, when I think of like Abba and Preach, or just Abba in particular, when he makes statements with Destiny about the vulnerabilities of men, right? It is sort of like we contribute to the world we live in. So. If if Abba doesn't like being vulnerable with women because women always feel like they're getting a prize and Destiny agrees they are, it's his vulnerability. 
It's weird the ways we want to be close to people, but then we deny them. So in some ways, Abba is self-sabotaging by not being vulnerable with women and not letting them get excited that he's being vulnerable with them. He's denying himself the ability to meet someone who will honor that vulnerability. Now, I understand getting hurt, revealing your privacy, him being worth a lot of money. That might be a really scary thing to go, um, to uh, a scary adventure to go on, right? I can totally understand that. When I'm thinking about myself, because I am a smaller YouTuber, though still I do not want people running around being like, I'm Brittany Simon's boyfriend. It's like, that's not what I want either. I want to marry somebody who's honorable and lovely and honest with me, but also is the person that I can help grow and they can help me grow. The person that I can be vulnerable with and they can be vulnerable with me and a person who will honor that vulnerability. I don't want my partner, like as a, as a, sort of woman who has a harder time being actually truly vulnerable with people um, outside of like crying over dead babies uh, in foreign countries, which I think is a very easy thing to be emotional over. When I'm talking about insecurities of the personhood, my own consciousness, my own fear in life, I'm going to give that to somebody and I want him to honor it and not throw it away or tweet about it later. I really hope, God forbid, that I don't end up, you know, if I end up getting divorced, I hope my person and I hope I do too, especially now that I've learned from having past relationships on the internet, I hope we can manage to split in a way that it works for us. Like I was just listening to Joy Coy, jo Joseph, Joseph, <laughs> talk to Andrew Schultz. And he was talking about him and Chelsea Handler and Andrew kept asking and asking and asking and asking because they were quite critical of that relationship. And Joe jo said, you know, look like this, I had fun with Chelsea. I don't want to talk about this relationship. Like I'm in, I'm older. Like this is, he was trying to make it, he was so obviously trying to say, I'm an adult and I'm not going to talk bad about my ex-partners. And there's something about that that's so respectful as somebody who's talked so much major shit on her ex-partners. Video after video after video, as I age, there is something so respectable about that that I love so much. I think it is so easy to be petty in love, but if I'm striving for something greater, and I am, I have to be greater. So those are ways in which I am now self-reflecting, you know, like we always do constantly. It's not like I've never done this before. But it's hard when you don't have a real thing in front of you. You only have examples of what it means to honor your partner's feelings. So when I was a feminist, I thought honoring my partner's feelings came second to honoring my own. And I think when I was in conservative bubbles, I thought my feelings came second to my partner. And I think the, the way that I view the world now, the bubble I've created, is that I want us to honor our feelings as they need to be honored. Equally, meaning when they come up, I want to honor your pain. If you feel like I've done something, talk to me. If I feel like you've done something, I hope I feel safe enough to talk to you about it. And that's sort of a beautiful um, uh, sense of awareness that I think I had to learn the hard way. When I was in past relationships, I understand that I was also the kind of person to be in that relationship. I really, I wasn't too much better than the people I was dating. And I don't like to really compare it that way. I just think we had different ethics and morals. And so because of that, it made one of us feel more superior to the other. But I don't want to feel that way about my partner. Though, you know what's funny? Now that I'm like courting and I'm doing this very serious relationship dating at the moment, I'm realizing that I think it's easier and safer to almost be vulnerable in some ways because you're both trying to expedite the process of dating quickly enough that you're saying, hey, these, this is just who I am. Take it or leave it. But something about that is almost easier than when you're actually together because there has to be a moment through the dating um, or courting experience where we've gone from now, you can leave me whenever you want to now we're a couple and I'm going to stop asking you questions as if your answer will make me dump you. Does that make sense? Some people get into relationships and then they're like, during the marriage, if you do or say something, I'll divorce you. And I think that's reasonable. Cheating, we all have boundaries, all this stuff. But for me, I kind of have the thought process of I'm going to vet you so carefully, I think initially, even if it's a short term and uh, um, a short term like engagement or dating process, let's say a three months, you can still, I think, put people in situations to sort of quickly grasp what kind of energy they're going to bring to the relationship. Like, you know, if you observe a relationship, you know what kind of a couple it is. You know the energy that's being espoused, the kind of men that date kinds of women, the kind of women that date kinds of men. And so when we're sitting here and we're observing ourselves, what kind of a woman am I and what kind of a man is he is always the question to ask oneself. And then it's not just the trope itself you're dating, but the person who makes that trope. So, you know, sometimes I'll talk to people 
And this month has been a theme of beauty. Lots of my callers have been talking about, well, what, what's the rating scale? What does it mean to be beautiful? What does anything mean on a spectrum? Everything is categorized, everything's on a spectrum. What does that mean? It means it's an experience that's lived, which means we cannot so childlike um, minimize or simplify existence, but yet the nuance is allowing the simplicity and complexity to live amongst um, one another at the same time. So as an example, um, you'll have men and women, okay, you'll have respect, um, and we'll have, I don't know what men, it's it's confusing to me what men, actually, this is a chance for the men in my audience to just leave a comment in the sections down below. Please tell me um, what your version of, a, of this is. So for women, traditionally and generally speaking, we fall out of love, it seems, because we lose respect for our male partners. It's really difficult to live in a world, at least in America, let's say the West, in America where there's like this vibe from men where they feel like their women should be a very particular way and I do not fit that trope, which is fair and I don't mind. And the only men that seem super interested in women like me are men who are open to allowing space for me in their life as a main character. This is very particular and important. I noticed that when I dated men, even within my favorite trope of like guys I find attractive, if I wasn't dating the right man with the right personality, everything I did was sort of a competition to their masculinity versus um, something I could add to the relationship as a whole. And I think that's fair because even when I was dating those men in my feminist days, I was comparing us as, hey, I bring this to the table. What do you bring? You have to bring something. And that something usually meant equal to what I was bringing versus the best that they could provide. Now, the best that they could provide wouldn't have been enough anyways, which is why I never ended up married to those people or compatible with them long term. We weren't actually compatible. Neither of us had to be bad or good people, but we weren't compatible. And though those people were complicated and layered, I never thought of any of them as actually like evil. So what? My ex-boyfriend cheated on me. That's pretty shitty. That's a bad behavior. And I'm really fucking pissed about it. But I'm not actually thinking in my head that he's evil. And so I think that's really important for people to realize just because I have really strong and very hurt feelings in regards to people of my past, I don't actually view those people as evil. I view them as literally living in a different bubble. So when women are dating men and we lose respect for them, it's really hard for us to remember why we love them. What is the man's equivalent to that? Is it like a woman's loyalty? Is it a woman's like ability to praise you? I've always dated men too who felt like if people talk shit about me in public, I expect you to defend me. And I think that that's easier now than it was in the past. As a feminist, I was really, really against performative uh, defending. Like I didn't like the pandering. It felt like virtue signaling. So when my partner was just dead wrong, He'd be like, defend me. And I'm like, you're dead wrong. Not to be such a fucking, you know, analytical person right now, but like, you're just dead wrong. So defending you feels dead wrong, right? So that's why they kind of say to date people with your values. So they're sort of a reflection of your own. But at the same time, we're different people in relationships. We're not like, I'm not a reflection of my partner. He's not a reflection of me. But then you kind of are. So that adds the, you know, it brings in an added layer of, your identity being sort of, again, once again in your life, like mixed with another person's and sort of dependent on that person's. And so you are allowing, you are asking yourself in a committed relationship, like the one we're sort of exploring, you are saying, I trust you enough to associate with you. I trust you enough to do right by me. I trust myself enough to allow you grace and leeway or, or leniency through the nuance of existence, maybe we make a mistake, maybe something comes up, but you are asking something very big of someone. You're asking someone to be attached to you. And that's a very particular ask. And I don't think this is just a YouTuber thing. I think if you're a local person in your local community, I, I think you know this, when your girls get a guy or your guy gets a girl, don't you observe who it is, what kind of a girl it is, what kind of guy it is. Does he open the door for her? Is he nice? Is he like... You look and you see and you get the vibe. I was watching uh, No Jumper and I was watching the three people, uh, Destiny, Adam, and the black guy. I don't know his name yet. I'm still learning. I don't even know. What's what's Adam's wife's name? Lena? 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 Lena the plug? Lena? 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 Something like that. 
her too, I'm still like learning her name, even though I know who she is. I don't know these people enough to like, but they have relationships that are so different from how I view even mine. Even though Destiny and I are progressive enough to overlap, even though Adam and I are progressive enough to overlap and the black guy was way too conservative red pill for me, but you know, it's still not the same relationship I'm aiming for because neither of them, well, like Melina and Lena, Lena, they're both obviously businesswomen. They're both obviously like dominating in their fields enough that they're one of the the girls, right? They're like one of the top women, right? As far as I know, like Melina is and she is, right? She's like one of the most famous porn stars. So I feel like there's um there's like these strong women who are making these decisions, dating these progressive men. And then these red pill guys, I'm not quite sure the kind of women that they're attracting, but it does seem more competitive competitive in those relationships versus Destiny isn't competing with Melina about their value. They're both valuable. And I don't think Adam and Lena, Lena are like competing for their uh, but like who has more value. I think other people are looking in and deciding who has more value, whose career was stronger, who grew faster than the other, who is more popular, who has more. It's like, I don't want to do this with my partner. I want us to be excited that we're both growing in different ways, whatever our career paths, whatever our family choices are. I want to trust someone enough to be vulnerable enough with someone to say, hey, I know we're content creators or I'm a content creator and you're marrying one and that's really intense and like you can't post our babies on Facebook and there's a lot of layers here, but I'm asking you to, to go on this adventure with me all the same. I was listening to Roman Atwin, talk to Logan Paul on Impulsive and he was saying his wife Brittany and him have been together like many, many, many years, like I think 15 years plus, they have multiple kids and they recently came back into Mormonism, which is crazy because like he didn't grow up Mormon. I guess Brittany had a past in Mormonism if I remember the podcast correctly and I was thinking about that and I was trying to think about what that must mean. Now his mother had died, Romans, and as a way to kind of grieve her he went back to church which if you guys have done calls with me you'll know if you have a similar situation how many times i've recommended go to church it's okay i know i'm an atheist agnostic i get it it's crazy but i think church can be a great place for someone to find a foundation again and so they have and they're trying to be pretty good mormons they're trying to be pretty good people but mostly the focus is the family yes we can build a career we can make lots of money but what's the point of all this money if we come home and our marriage is on is, is on the rocks i just watched Ela talk to christina p on the mom podcast that christina p does and Ela was saying like oh ethan and i don't feel like a couple we haven't in a couple years you know it's hard with the kids blah 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 and all i'm thinking and i was critical during my live show and someone was like a little upset with that that I feel like if your kids are the tops of your relationships, you're failing as parents. Like in what world do you wanna convince a kid that they are so powerful that grown people will bow to them? And you wonder why kids are being raised as narcissists. Like it's kind of insane to me that the same people that are like, I can't raise my kid to be an asshole are the same ones who pussy out to their own children. And they wonder why those kids grow up entitled and assuming that everyone should just give them things. Well, cause you raised your kids and allowed them to get what they wanted. Like you literally, yeah, like the fight between parent and child is the parent wants to raise the child to be a functional part of society, which the child doesn't understand yet because they're still young. They don't even know what a society is. And the point of a child is to explore, question, and push boundaries as a way to gather tools to be a functional member of society subconsciously because they don't even know they're going to be yet until they're a little older. Now in religion, some religions, like seven-ish, is usually the age of understanding so like kids should be able to understand their actions but i think that's a really big ask considering that a lot of adults don't even understand their own actions right <clears throat> so when i think about love and i think about how much we don't understand about ourselves i can't help but be grateful when we have a person in our lives who can help be that mirror that we need to sort of reflect but not trauma dump onto. So one of the reasons I love my current relationship is because my partner and I are more than open to therapy. We're more than open to outside sources. We're more than open to reading books. We're more than open to taking classes. We're more than open to seek the wisdom of other people outside of our own, though we're so confident and well um, versed in our own bubble that we feel pretty damn good about leading our own lives. We're not like pussying out to our life but we're also not so arrogant that we're gonna reject help from outside sources that could help us. So in some ways, I am asking from the universe, I'm asking from my partner, I asked the universe to send me this person and I swear to God, they, they served, girl, they served. They gave me exactly what I wanted. But this person that I'm dating is like, <clears throat> I am asking him 
to do a lot. I'm asking him to date a YouTuber. I'm asking him to meet my family. I'm asking him to adhere or at least understand like why I do the things that I do. And that's a really big ask. In particular though, I'm asking if he can handle me. I'm asking if he can take on the burden of my, my Britney-ness sort of, you know, and I hope I become his favorite burden. I hope that I am his favorite burden in the way that I hope he is mine. Everything's a burden. Dogs, cats, living, existing, taking in some oxygen. The fact that I'm recording this podcast um, and I need to be live in about 30 minutes. Girl, not going to happen. I'm going to be late. Everything we want to do, even like the joy of living itself can be a burden, but that doesn't have to be a negative word. It can be something um, like a responsibility. So instead of saying burden, you can think responsibility. But what does it mean to hold responsibility? If I go to my partner and say, I would love it if I could believe you were responsible enough um, and respectable enough to handle what you've consented to. But then what happens if later down the road they can't handle it? Am I going to punish them? Am I going to abandon them? Is that why maybe they're lying to me? Not my current partner, just in general, and not the me. Just I'm just giving examples. Okay. So what have I done to set up an environment to invite honesty from my partner? So that's something that I've always strived to do in all my relationships, but I understand my personality is incredibly black and white and I totally understand that it can be intimidating and I understand it can make people feel afraid to be honest with me. I'm kind of hoping through gay judgment and exploring ideas, even in public, people can see that of course I'm open to you being whoever you are. But you can't possibly think that I'm not going to have a strong opinion about it. I have a strong opinion about colors, anime characters, food, microphone covers. Like I have strong opinions on a lot of things, right? You think I'm not going to have a strong opinion about your choices? That doesn't mean that I'm going to reject you or never see you again. It just means we have to have a different conversation about the kinds of people we are and the kinds of journey we want to go on together. So in some ways, what I'm asking from someone that I'm dating and that I'm going to marry is that I'm asking them to give me a space, an environment themselves, where I can feel safe enough to be open. Ironically enough, I think I'm the ABBA in my relationship, meaning I think that ABBA is worried about being vulnerable in front of women who just like, oh, I got got his vulnerability, because he's afraid that they're gonna go like tweet about it or talk about it or brag about it. I have that fear. But I also know that I think I've picked somebody that wouldn't do that to me, hopefully. And I'm hoping that I know that because I can trust my own judgment. But also I'm looking at his actions and he is inviting me into his life, but not smothering me. He's saying, I'm here, but I understand you have a whole life. Like right now I messaged him and I said, hey, I got to go film this podcast. I have to go live. I love you, blah, blah, blah. And it was very much like, go, go do your job. Have a great day at work. Encouragement versus other people that I've dated have not allowed me an environment to be myself. Why are you working? Why do you work so much? Well, why can't you spend time with me? I don't understand. I understand that they were complaining. And so some people would say, well, they're bad at relationships, but what if they're just not compatible for you? What if they can't literally because of their tools and because of their personality actually offer you a space to be vulnerable? Maybe they can, and then because they can't offer it to you, you might lose respect for them. And as a woman to a man, if a man isn't gonna allow me to be vulnerable about my feelings or explain why I'm emotionally entangled in a concept, even though I can be analytical about it as well, but I wanna be emotional about it, it's gonna be very hard not to feel insane. As many of you guys know, my borderline is directly triggered by being feeling, like by by people gaslighting me basically. So if I go to somebody and they're like, no, Brittany, like you're not gay, you don't know anything about yourself, that would trigger me after a while because you start to question like, Do I not know that I love to eat pussy? I mean, I do it so often. I got to know I like it, right? Why would I keep doing it? You kind of start to question your reality of, do you know something I don't know about myself? No, I know myself. I've done all this work to know myself. I'm going to put this opinion to the side, but thank you. It actually shows two things. One, the openness of the mind to be considerate and be like, are you right? And then the confidence to be like, oh, nope, you're wrong. I checked the data. You're incorrect. Your calculation is wrong. And so it allows you to move past it. But if you were, do you guys, does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. So basically love is like an equation and it's a a feeling you go through. So the equation of a good relationship might be something like um, treat your partner with consideration and kindness. And that might look like, hey, I know Brittany has to work. I'll wait for you. I won't message you or maybe I will, but I'll, you know, I know I'm muted. Something like I'm not going to text you during your live shows as a way to not distract you. That's so sweet. Like, thank you. Because they know I'm like super distracted. And I'm like, when I'm in love, I'm just like, I'm in love. 
So I understand, I think that's just such a lovely, so kind and so considerate, right? Um, but then somebody else might say, oh, hey, I did like a 10 hour stream and you didn't come see me once or say hi, or I love you. And I really missed you today. And I felt abandoned by you. Oh my gosh. It's like, no matter what you do, if you're the wrong person with the wrong person, it's going to come out wrong and you're not going to have a cohesive relationship. So instead of looking at our relationships like they failed, I feel like you should look at them like things that could have been, but weren't actually meant to be. So it's a little cheesy, but it's a little more realistic, I think, than preemptively thinking I'm a shit person because I chose another shit person. You're probably just also so incompatible. You're driving each other to be more shit than you were. Before I was in my relationships, I was a better person, but I was a worse person in them and then a better person out of them, if that makes sense. Now I feel like I'm still a good person or like healthy person in my relationship and I the trajectory is going up, which is probably a sign that it's actually a compatible relationship, right? Versus the ones I had in the past that were so incompatible, it was driving me crazy. So again, instead of looking at our love life or our stories as something that has to be, um, well, I've chosen this person, so now I have to double down and never break up with them. Or, hey, I don't ever wanna be vulnerable or get hurt, so I'm never gonna date in the first place. Open, but with boundaries. We are open, but we have boundaries. We are trying to figure out the best way to maintain respect for our partners and dignity and love in the relationship. So being open, saying I'm open to being vulnerable, that's something that's really important to me. I, you know, I cry a lot on stream over politics and news stories, and I cry a lot on stream over silly things, or maybe I'm just like on my period. But the cry I can cry in front of a partner that respects my vulnerability is a cry so good. It's so good. And it's so different than a cry I've had in the past being vulnerable in different ways. So you know how like I believe in parts, like the parts of a person? There are people who have parts that have seen my other parts and we've cried together. Let's say I've cried with another woman over our femininity or our bodies or our problems with our like masculine presenting faces or something like that. It's like, wow, that's a cry that's really good. I'm not gonna have that same cry with my partner because he's a guy, that's never gonna happen. But the cry that I can have with him that I can't have with my girlfriends is only reserved for the person I'm gonna marry be or be with long-term. We're not saying long-term monogamous relationships or poly relationships need to be marriage to be valid. I'm just giving you examples of my own life. That's the person I'm gonna marry because that's the person who allows me to be vulnerable like as a whole person instead of just parts of me. Does that make sense? So when I'm with my partner, I feel like I'm allowed to be vulnerable in a whole human being and ask him for help and vice versa from like the perspective of my whole essence as a Britney versus in the past or even with girlfriends or friends or sisters or mothers or whoever, I can only be vulnerable to an extent. Like when my little brother asks me about my borderline and I'm like kind of being vulnerable with him, I can only be vulnerable within the, the mech, like with, with use, within the bubble of like the language of his bubble. So I can't just explain to him my actual vulnerabilities because they wouldn't make sense to his brain. He doesn't see me like a woman. He sees me like a sister. My partner has the capabilities and the skill set. I've talked about this in the past, how your partners are your caretakers, your siblings, friends, and like your, your, um, your lovers. So basically my partner, cause they can see me as I've desired, I want, I want this so badly in a partner. And I feel like I found it where when I'm vulnerable, I'm not being vulnerable as like this version of Brittany. I'm being vulnerable as Brittany. And he can take all that information and all of my crazy sentence structures and the way that I talk and all of these things and just translate them and understand them. He doesn't even talk like I talk, but but because he is who he is and because I am who I am, I can talk like myself, like even more uncensored than any podcast or any YouTube video I've ever done, just like myself. Like I'm in a room and I'm talking to myself. I can just talk to him and he'll understand it. And then if he has any confusion because we're humans, he can ask a question and I'll clarify. And he's like, great, cool. And even though it gets a little like my feelings will be like, oh, I'm gonna get rejected or no, he won't like this. He's always able to view me as a whole Britney, not just through the lens of his politics, not through the lens of his life, not through the lens of, but through the lens of mine. And that is so powerful and amazing. But I don't think I could have gotten there unless I was ready to be open. Now it's taking me a second to really melt down all my little walls. 
But I also know why that's happening and he understands why it's happening. I have a lot more at risk, just realistically, right? I'm the public figure. And as we just watched QXC and his girlfriend have a drama online, and as we've seen in my past relationships drama online, I don't want that again. I want our relationship to be something out of that, that is like respectful and loving. So how do I do that? How do I do it and not fuck it up again? Okay. Okay. I have to trust someone to help me. So I have to accept his help. I have to be, even though I'm this like badass woman who does her own shit, I have to be actually open to asking for help when I need it instead of pretending everything's fine. So hard, but I will do it. I will be better at it as time goes on. And then when you're in a relationship, when I now I am giving permission to that person to make me a better person. You know, I suck with patience. And I think a lot of what he is bound to teach me is patience. But also, I think I'm ready to be that person for him as well. And we'll leave his side of the story out of it because that's his business. But from my perspective, I am ready to be vulnerable. I am ready to say, okay, I'll do this with you. And only you. You'll be the top dog because you are the only person who can be a caretaker, a friend, and a lover at the same time. Everyone else cannot be that. I can't go to my parents and be both lover and child to them. That doesn't make sense, right? I can't go to my siblings and be lover and friend with them. It doesn't make sense. I can't go to my friends and just like be lover and friend with them in a way that will allow me depth. In my past, in my poly life, in my open life, um, I did fuck a lot of my friends and they were cool and awesome and amazing. But I always felt a wall up because they were never all of the things. They could only be my friend and lover, but they couldn't be my caretaker at the same time. They couldn't see me for all that I was. They could pretend they could be a a little, like a, like a fill, like a, what's this called? Like a, like good enough for now. Oof, that sounds so bad. But they could, you know, we just, and look, we didn't end up together. They're with really amazing people and happy relationships. So at the end of the day, this always comes back to, are we compatible or are we just here in the moment? And I don't want to have relationships now that are just here in the moment and good enough. I want to say, yeah, you are good enough, literally, that I had all these pickings and I did and I still chose you, right? I'm choosing you. I hope you choose me. I'm inviting you into my life. I hope you invite me into yours. After all that is done, now it's about maintaining that love and that vulnerability, saying that as we gain um, years and we have time and memories together, I hope that we become more intertwined and more accessible to one another, but also we don't drown in each other in codependency, that we make each other better, that I'm able to say, hey, I think we're spending too much time together. Or, hey, I don't think we're spending enough time together. Or, hey, I really want you. You know what I'm saying? I, I know that from my life, at least, love has been such a struggle because obviously I have childhood trauma and knowing when someone loves you versus someone wants you is really hard to, to, to know. So you kind of have to go with guts, like your gut, but you also have to heal enough to have a healthy enough gut to know what you're dealing with. Trauma gut and in, in, um, recovery gut is different for Brittany. So when I'm going through life, I look back at my journal posts and a lot of them were pretty good, like 50% right, 60% right. But they were always missing an element of honesty that I couldn't see at the time because I was so afraid of letting my vulnerability show that I was denying my partners of my past, my vulnerabilities. And we've had this conversation on VC. I want it to be clear. There is a difference between a toxic relationship that says, give me everything that you are so I know you're loyal to me. Give me everything before I've even earned it, which I felt like were the relationships I kind of had in the past versus the relationship now, which is, hey, I love you. And I want to marry you and spend a life with you. So let's make sure that we are being honest and loving and forthcoming and okay with anything that happens. Maybe we date and it doesn't work. Maybe we date and it does. But we need to go through something together in the most on, like honorable, open, honest, authentic way for us to even make sure that it was going to be compatible in the first place. So that process, because it's starting off with so much just bu like bullet point demandings from me, kids, house, like do you understand that these are the things I want? Either you're in or you're out, like blah, blah, blah. Now allows for us to have the more intimate conversations now that we've packed past the um, initial like dating stages of what do you think um, of Trump? What do you think of life? What do you think of jails? What do you think of trans kids? What do you think of, now that we're past all that, now we're into the really hard stuff, which is, whoa, I'm asking a whole other consciousness to decide if they wanna spend their life with me. 
that's a really fucking big ask. And how could I ask that of somebody that I'm not also asking um, of them their vulnerabilities and their, their insecurities? And then in turn, who am I to deny them that of me when I'm asking so much of them? And also, why wouldn't I want it? Why wouldn't I want someone I can spend my life with and grow old with that I can give everything to? I was watching Indian Matchmaker and one of the girls who I love is such a girl boss, but she said something to the, um, something like, uh, do you know some women spend like all their free time with their husbands? Like who wants to see their husband every day? And I was like, girl, okay, no judgment, girl. Maybe that's truly how you feel. It sounds a little bit like projection or like insecurity to me, but I, sure. One of the things I had to learn coming out of feminism was that I was allowed to want to fall in love with a guy, but in particularly like at all. I understand I'm a bisexual like icon. I love being gay, whatever. But in this lifetime, women and I are not syncing up. I don't know what it is. And so I'm syncing up with all these like really progressive and wonderful men. And I'm wondering like why that is. A big part of it is like, I don't know if queer women are comfortable enough right now to deal with the baggage of my family. And I don't know if I'm comfortable enough, to be honest with you. Like, to be honest with you, I don't think I'm much different from other queer people that like in our own bubbles, yeah, we love being gay, but we're not just gay. We're not monoliths. There's like a whole bunch of interesting facts about every gay person that makes us all different from one another. And one of the things that makes me cool and different is that my parents are immigrants and they're from a very like strict culture. So the only person that I think would have the tools at this time, being a millennial or Gen Z or millennial, who could actually handle that life with me would probably be a guy who's progressive. Versus a conservative guy would never work. Um, and a queer woman might never work because she would never have access to my family or resources. There would be almost no benefit to her to marrying me. And it would be a very hard life versus ending up with a person with liberal parents who would accept her. So in so many ways, our compatibility is also the time and era we're existing in. I think there are millions of people that I'm compatible with. A million good, wonderful humans that I could build really great lives with. Men and women, maybe even some non-binary folk, right? But ultimately, I ended up with the human that I ended up with, and I'm picking the human that I'm picking because of this, this moment of our lives, this moment in history, this moment in terms of like social politics, we are insanely compatible. Maybe in a different era we wouldn't have been, but we wouldn't have been the same people. So that's sort of the hard thing that I've had to process personally, just, just for Brittany, is that so much of my borderline, this is so dumb, I have borderline because my parents basically gaslit me my whole life about being gay, but I'm bisexual and I ended up with a man. And so I failed the queer communities. I've proven my parents right that I'm straight. And the only person who might actually understand where I'm coming from, hopefully is my partner. Someone who can say, I, I totally get it. Like you had all of these options, but you really, you really for your true joy had, it had to have been this way if that makes sense. I guess I had this idea in my head that I would, you know, have that gay relationship to kind of like checkpoint, whoop, done. But the truth is, is that I haven't fallen in love with any women recently, that I've loved women in the past and that I've had great relationships with them, but there's been no one in my life that I have fallen in love with, man or woman, until now, and it just happened to be a man. But that itself comes with the baggage of the bubbles. So the greatest part about my relationship is that, um, him and I don't want to live in a bubble. We want to live in the bubble of our own making. So there's no real like cultural bubble we're interested in. There's no specific like gay bubble we're interested in. We really just want to have the bubble of our family. And so I know that I'm the kind of person that will end up a family woman and that I will have our life not centered around the kids like Ethan and Hila where they're losing sleep and their romantic relationship is suffering. And I'm not going to have a relationship that's all about the adults involved where the point where the kids are just being sent from home to home because they're so neglected. I want a family life. I want a life with somebody and my family. And to have family, you have to, you have to have like get along to some extent. You have to make it make sense. You know what I mean? Like make it make sense. Sometimes I look at the diversity amongst my siblings and I think, who are you all going to date? They're all going to date people that are perfect for them, hopefully, and marry them that are perfect for them. But they're still going to be perfect for my my sibling, which means that they're probably going to be a little bit off to my parents. That still works and you can still get along. You know, when I talk, sometimes I worry that you guys are hearing me say something like, 
don't be gay so you can get along with your parents. That's not the fuck what I'm saying. Ditch your fucking parents if you're gay. Like, ditch them if that's what it takes. What I'm saying is, depending on the kind of human you are, like me, I need what I need first. So it's always about Brittany. Brittany wants this partner. You guys need to accept it or not. I've already given this speech to my parents and my family. I'm, I'm in love. I'm bringing home this person. You can like him or not like him, but I've made my decision. And I want you guys to meet him and love him because I know you will. And I do think they will. But that doesn't change the fact that they might not. And even if they might not, I totally get why they might have issues around it. But I also think that they're not correct. Just factually. They're incorrect about their assessment. Unless they can give me a true red flag of danger, which I am open to hearing because I've made mistakes in the past. Unless they can give me a real reason, then they might just not get along with someone who's a stranger because it's scary in my family to marry someone because you get brought into the inner circle. And I don't mean like in a culty way. I mean like in a, you know, we want to talk about our lives without feeling like someone's going to put it on the internet. Because some of y'all be marrying people that be secretly recording, posting your shit on the internet, causing rumors around you. I mean, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, this woman, she was married, but she obviously was an inner circle. This woman has no sense of loyalty or honesty in her bones. So that's the thing is like, I want to facilitate ha healthy existences in my own life. So it has to start with me. So I have to be selfish. Brittany first, mental health relationships then my family, or then my job, then my family, right? So me and my partner first, our family, our kids, then my job, then my family. My family is third. Even though you guys have heard me rant about my family this whole time, they're always number one in my life, but my family also taught me something very important. You leave your family and cling to your husband. You leave your family and cling to your wife. I'm being given permission by my family to go be happy in my relationships, even if during the initial processing, they have strong opinions about what I should do. They always want me to know that my job is to leave them to go live my life. So it's kind of like multi-layered. When you give someone the right, like the ability to be vulnerable, like I'm giving this person my vulnerabilities and these are vulnerabilities that I would have traditionally mostly given to my family. And so in some ways, no wonder it's a like a feeling of loss, I'm sure, when your kids get married or your siblings get married because you're like, all those girl talks, now you're going to do it with your, your person because there's I, nothing better. There's just nothing better than having a person to talk to and share your vulnerabilities with. And now I, I mean, I always got it, but I get it in a real way where my parents always said, like, we're each other's best friends. We tell each other everything. I love talking to your dad more than anyone. Or my dad would say, I love talking to your mom more than anyone. And it's so true. Like, ultimately, yeah, my dad wants to hear what his friends have to think about politics, but he really wants to know what my mom thinks. And same, I really want to know what my sister thinks, but I really want to know what my person thinks. Because ultimately, when you're asking your partner what they think, you are you get to see, like, your whole future together and how you're going to talk to your kids and how you're going to interact with the world. When I ask my sister a question, I'm just seeing what she feels like in this moment. It doesn't mean anything for our friendship at all. Like, I'm like, cool, you believe that. Nice. I'm just like, all right. It doesn't mean anything about my future. But when I ask my person, I'm like, oh, I want to stay up for the rest of my life looking at this face, talking to this person, sharing these ideas. And I do want to make sure that we view reality at least mostly the same. So I'm not too shocked when their answers are a little bit more unique than mine or different from mine. They are still coming from a foundation in which we agree kindness matters, consent matters, authenticity matters. But honestly, like honoring each other's feelings and who we are matters the most. Saying to yourself, okay, I'm going to choose this good person and I'm a good person. And as long as we are good to each other and kind to each other, we can maintain something beautiful. The moment I doubt him, the moment I doubt myself, the moment I hate him for, you know, through trauma lens, the moment I've decided to, to bring up negative feelings of my past or drown in my own anxiety, I've already lost the chance to overcome my past behaviors and make better ones. So instead of getting lost, I will communicate to him, hey, I'm so sorry, I think I'm having a BPD day, or hey, I think I might be in my feelings, like I'm observing you really differently today and I don't know why, something like that, some sort of communication tool that doesn't put the blame on him, but allows him, if for some reason, some reason it ends up being his quote unquote fault, I hate that word, fault, then if I can word it that way, because I mean it that way, he can be given an opportunity to say, hold on, did I, did I do something? Wait, maybe I did something. Shit, did I do something? Again, going back to what I said at the beginning of the conversation, building an environment that allows me 
to be vulnerable without blaming allows him to take responsibility if it happened to be his fault. Maybe it was just borderline brain. That's a thing that happens with borderline is like it could just be my brain and has nothing to do with anything. I could just literally switch and I'm like, oh, I feel unsafe right now. What do I do with that? You know, but it allows an environment where he then can talk to me about it. And again, I almost like to look at my borderline too as like a separate person because when I am triggered, I'm just not like myself. And so it's nice for me to deal with somebody who understands like it's in me. I'm making those decisions, but I am also having an experience where I'm disassociated. I don't feel like myself. I don't mean to hurt you. That's not what I mean to do. Right. Okay. With that said, I think that's about all I wanted to say. I'm looking at my notes. I think that's it. I do want to know what's the men's version of women who lose respect for their partners often fall out of love. What's the men's version of that? I'm assuming it's loyalty. That's my guess. But I am curious. And then I'm curious on any thoughts you guys have. Thank you for listening to me rant. I think I'm actually right on time. It's a little bit short of a podcast, I think. But I'm about to go live on YouTube, so that will be exciting. Just a reminder, the podcasts are here weekly now. Um, I am editing them myself. So, you know, thank you. But thanks to Len for being my editor in any other way. I don't have the budget quite to pay Len to do my podcasts because they're quite lengthy and I don't have that kind of money, especially with all my medical bills right now. But if you guys would like to add to the Len Fund, which allows me to pay him to help me edit podcasts so I can take more calls, please check out Patreon and join us for five, ten dollars whatever is good for you. But at $10, you get the Discord, which has like events. We do yoga. I pay a professional to come teach us. We do a whole bunch of stuff together there. So if you guys want, that's a really cool vibe. It's a really cool place to be. I really, really, really recommend coming to join us. Um, and then there was, oh, one last thing. So we're in the month of September. Big announcement. Now that I'm on the up and up, thanks to my nutritionist and stuff with my lupus, though I have very fucking hard days sometimes. Um, <clears throat> The podcast is back, which means we have to go back to one day of streaming, one day of podcast, and then every other day calls. I can't actually, like, I cannot keep up with the lupus. They say people with lupus need to sleep up to 12 hours a day. Like, I cannot run as successfully if I'm not getting at least 10 hours right now. I've noticed that if I'm in bed for 8 to 10 hours, it's much better for me. So what I'm going to do is starting in October, because we're done. This is, um... This is the, this is Monday the 19th. Um, this is the last live show day. I know this is a podcast, but this is the last live show day. And then I'm going to go on vacation. I'll see you guys um, in October. When I come back in October, we are doing live shows every Monday, podcasts every Wednesday, and calls every other day of the week. So people have a whole extra day to call me, which is Fridays now. And I think that's going to work out better for people in the long run, but mostly for my lupus. Again, Brittany's mental health has to be first because if that crumbles, if I fuck up with my lupus, guys, I'm not going to be able to be a YouTuber. It's so stressful, like waking up with chronic pain and your body's just in so much pain and you're like, what the fuck is this? And so I'm so grateful that I am a YouTuber in so many ways because you guys are so lenient and wonderful and open to me taking my time and being sick and taking a couple weeks off to go do my thing and figure out what I'm doing with my life. And I just appreciate that so much. But that that is what we're going to do. I know I'm changing it a lot on you since May. Um, but I think that that needs to happen. The podcasts are awesome. I love doing them. So in order to keep the podcasts, I got to get rid of one of my stream days. So I'll see you Mondays and Wednesdays. Otherwise, have a great day. I hope I see you over on Patreon, on the Discord especially. I'd love to hear your voices there. And with that said, I will see you next week. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Bye. In my head, in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool.